I'd like to do is look at recent events in Israel, um, the notion of intelligence failure, compare that to the, what happened 50 years prior, the same kind of intelligence failure in Israel, although I have to say, and I'll preface it all now, what happened last month makes the people in 1973 look like responsible professionals. Um, and then what I'd like to do before I finish is to try and suss out a clearer definition of intelligence failure. I think the ones we use are woolly, they're analytically useless, um, and if we can tighten that up, that might actually give us a concept which we can use to fix things. So, here we go. Um, I haven't put any graphic imagery, by the way, uh, so you don't have to like worry about that. We've all had enough of that, I'm sure. Um, so how was this achieved on the 7th of October? Hamas, to my mind at least, has been preparing for this for at least two years. Um, the kinds of things they would need to understand and gather information on in their preparations would take that long. The drilling would take that long. So you have to, I'm not sure the media was all that clear about the Israeli defenses around the Gaza border, but they're substantial. Um, fencing, sensors both like on and under the ground and in the air, um, automatic like remote controlled uh, machine guns and auto cannons, like really, it's quite nightmarish and had I lived in Gaza, I would want to resist as well, not in this way, of course. Um, but the elaborate planning was quite evident within moments of the news breaking out. At least it was apparent to me. Um, this results from years of probing and testing and experimenting, um, accumulating an understanding of how the Israelis respond to particular situations. But let's look at the Israeli side. What's gone on here? Why was surprise achieved from their point of view? You have a new kind of preconception resembling the one in 1973, where you don't think much of your opponent. You are reassured that an attack like this is not in their self-interest. It's not what they're thinking about. Um, in fact, a week before, or at least so it was reported, a week before October 7th, uh, defense intelligence had briefed the defense minister, the chief of staff, and pr almost certainly the prime minister, although he's denied being at this briefing, that, um, that in fact it was not, that Hamas was still in maintenance mode, that it was more interested in using this finance to improve the situation in Gaza, that it was a responsible governing organization, that they wouldn't dare. And that in, in that meeting, they were discussing warning intelligence that had arrived from their own sources, from Egypt and from the United States, that we know of. Um, the view was that the threat in the West Bank was greater over the last number of years now, these kind of new nonpartisan uh, resistance brigades have cropped up in what's known as the Triangle uh, in the northern part of the West Bank. Um, that's been their f the focus of the security service and of defense intelligence. Moreover, settler provocations in the West Bank um, present new security problems. Um, the army had asked to withdraw three battalions from the Gaza area to the West Bank to cover the security situation over the holiday period, um, which Hamas chose deliberately, by the way. So to address the security concerns caused by the settlers. So you can see a compounding of embedded interest here from the customer's point of view to assume that their grasp of the situation is what makes sense. Because if you're wrong about Egypt and America's warning intelligence and your own, 
If you're wrong about that, that means you're wrong about your strategy in Gaza since 2014 and perhaps even longer. It means you're wrong about um, your attitude toward the settlers. It means you're wrong about security in the West Bank. So a cascade of problems that whatever was said at this briefing was clearly not convincing enough, and I'm not sure the staff intelligence themselves believed it. Um, Hamas exploits this timing. It was a Saturday morning, which is already very low alert in Israel. It's a complete drag when you're in the army to be on guard duty on Saturday morning. No one wants to be uh, stuck in a post like that when, in fact, most of your comrades are at home with their families. Um, I'm not sure Hamas timed it for like the propaganda value of the you know, anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, but they certainly did it because the Israelis were vulnerable. So this is kind of my basic overview of how surprise was achieved. If we compare it to 1973, a very different situation. The Israelis in 73 need two days' notice, two full days, to mobilize and respond to good warning intelligence. There are many parallels. There was, of course, the famous conceptia, again, the, this idea that um, the Egyptians wouldn't dare, that it's not in their interest, that they, ca they couldn't even if they tried. When specific, accurate, tactical warning comes in, it's at the uh, T minus t uh, H minus 10, right? So th there's not enough time to do anything about it. And in fact, if you start doing anything about it, as the um, chief of staff is now forced to think about how, how to respond to this warning from the Mossad's uh, double agent, they have the double-edged sword of, if we turn on our radars, we're going to lose them, because we, our defenses are not ready to deal with what's coming. Um, some new research has kind of been very helpful in the pr preparation of this paper. Um, Itai Shapira uh, has a very recent article kind of categorizing the failures of 1973 um, I've listed them here. Basically, a failure to spot Sadat's intentions, his change of strategy, to associate his kicking out the Egyptians, uh, the Soviets rather, as um, a change in attitude toward uh, launching an offensive. That is it, Shapira's other criticism, and this also comes out in his dissertation, is that. The Israelis don't use kind of social scientific methodology in their analysis. That there's early warning confusion about intentions and capabilities, that the Israelis are, of course, famously overconfident in their own analyses. And the, the, the system they have is overly dependent on uh, not just raw intel, but very high grade raw intel. So, like Hamas, Egypt are aware of their opponents' means of collection, their analytic habits, and they exploit them. And like Hamas, Egypt has nourished these false assumptions, um, sent out false warnings. I think the difference, in fact, is that Hamas signaled timidity over the last number of years. In the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, though, we have the Agronaut Commission, whose findings, I think very importantly, held every piece of the machine to account and created reforms that were designed to change the way the whole system worked and to ensure a kind of system of, that the system of democratic accountability extended toward the armed forces. Um, among their findings was the criticism that there's no structured methodology to analysis in defense intelligence. The Israelis send people out. Richard, um, Richard Hoyer wrote about meeting Israelis in the, after, in, in the mid to late 70s, coming to the States to learn how to do this. According to Shapira, they still don't. It's actually seen as limiting creativity. 
so you can see that the lessons are not exactly learned in the long term. You also have a problem in Israel, more currently, um, where there's a doctrinal shift away from land warfare. The reliance on air power is evident. Um, that the army is not, has not until very recently had to think about how to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an opponent. And it, it has been since the 70s, uh, since they thought that way. The other thing I would assert here is that we need in academia also more research on how psychology can help us understand how to overcome some of the barriers in analysis and in briefing. How do you convince someone who's made up their mind, even though you have good evidence, a good argument, and you know they're wrong? It's very difficult. Um, if you compare the outcome of the Argonaut Commission to the current situation, the other thing I want to highlight is that we have a system of accountability that was quite robust in the 70s in Israel. And over the last year, it's been hanging by a thread. I'm going to come back to that. Let's turn now toward intelligence failure. We are looking at a concept that has a variety of definitions in the research. Um, I find them analytically useless because they almost all of them, they require hindsight. And if they require hindsight, it means they are not di like useful diagnosis diagnostic tools. You can't actually reform anything on the basis of uh, what's already happened. You can't prepare for what's next. Um, Robert Jarvis's book, I think, is helpful. He parses the problem. Um, the intelligence can be wrong, and that can be a failure, and intelligence can do it wrong, so a kind of failure of professional standards. We'll come back to that. But what I'd like to do is point out that this issue of intelligence failure has become a kind of political meme. It is, uh, we scapegoat the intelligence community, po politicians scapegoat the intelligence community for their own mistakes, even when they're shared with the intelligence community. And what that does is, I think, yep, what it reinforces a cycle um, that weakens accountability. It, um, they'll throw money at the intelligence system to reform it uh, without actually solving this problem, necessarily, without knowing that they've solved this, uh, whatever failure had occurred, or without identifying any new problems which come up with these reforms. And as we saw yesterday, there's a tendency, generally speaking, by policymakers to ignore the self-assessment when you're doing net assessment. It is not the IC's job to figure out what we can do and what we want to do. So over the last, since the new year, basically, Israel's democratic accountability has been hanging by a thread. The prime minister has been trying to dismantle the uh, Supreme Court's ability to uh, shoot down laws which it deems uh, to be against the basic laws, the kind of informal constitution of the country. Um, the prime minister's freedoms hang on the line in the sense that it, the moment his premiership is over, he will be back on criminal trial, almost certainly. In the 70s, we have a similar but different problem with accountability. You had a very long-standing labor government, a labor dynasty, um, lots of frustrations are, um, toward them are exacerbated by the war and leads to labor's downfall. Civil rights are at the center of that. Um, the kind of labor organization's control of the labor market as well. The Agronaut Commission doesn't absolve leaders um, of their mistakes. I have very little confidence that we're going to see repeat of that at this time. So we, it, what I'd like to do is use this, uh, a clearer definition of intelligence failure to, um, to prevent that, uh, to, to break that cycle of uh, failed accountability. Thank, Thank you very much. much.